Yes, uh, thank you for coming. I know it's late and uh, you're all tired. Uh, so my name is Martin. Uh, I work for Amazon for Prime Video and uh, I want to talk a little about the profiler that we've done uh, at Amazon. Uh, so before I start talking about my profiler, uh, just do a quick introduction to profilers in general. Uh, uh, probably some of you never used one, so I just do a quick introduction. Uh, then I explain why did we decide to do another profiler, even though there is a bunch of profilers already. Uh, then I talk a little about the Hog Tracer features, uh, do a demo, and uh, hopefully we'll have time uh, for questions uh, at the end. So, a profiler basically is a tool that allows you to, um, to measure performance of the application, and you can basically uh, split existing profilers into two groups. Uh, the sample-based profiler that runs periodically and checks some, uh, some information from your application. So the simple profiler, simple sample-based profiler can be like that, that you have a while loop and uh, you check, uh, for example, the call stack uh, of a specific process uh, based on process ID. And, uh, and later on, you can, gather those you can gather those data and uh, generate some statistics. So for example, which function was called uh, most frequently. Um, this is not very accurate because that depends, the accuracy actually depends on the, on the sampling frequency. So, uh, for example, here we have uh, one second frequency. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good method to, uh, to find why your, your application is in general slow. Uh, but if you want to have like a very detailed data, for example, you had the spike uh, performance spi spike and uh, you, you want to understand what's going on, it's good to um, do an instrumentation-based profiling. So you basically modify your source code by putting some trace points and you exactly know um, how long or w how much resources did we use at that point of time. So for example here, uh, we have very simple profiling, uh, instrumentation-based profiling. We measure the time we spend in the full function by uh, saving the timer before calling the function and after calling the function, and then we print the results. Uh, there's apparently another uh, uh, profiling methodology is a guessing-based profiler <laughs> I've learned from Alex today, which is basically a developer looks at the code and tries to guess why the code is slow. <laughs> but yeah. Um, guess-based. Guess yeah, guess-based profiling. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk about this. And the hog tracer is instrumentation-based profiling. That means that you uh, need to modify your code. You need to put some trace points in the code uh, to, know, uh, to find why, uh, to measure uh, some of the metrics. So why did, they, that, why did we create the, uh, the profiler? There's a bunch of profilers already. There's Perf, Ftrace, LTTNG, uh, ETW for Windows, and, and many others. Um, so we have very, very specific environment. Um, at Amazon, uh, my team is responsible for delivering a Prime Video app on, uh, on living room devices like streaming sticks, smart TVs, uh, game consoles, and stuff like that. And uh, some of the devices are very, have a very limited capabilities uh, in terms of development. So basically all we can do, we can just generate the package, which is executable with some assets, and upload it to the device. So there is no way to SSH to that device. There's no way to run another process uh, and stuff like that. So we kind of cannot do much. We, well, all we can do is just to run our application that we built. Uh, also, uh, from the language point of view, uh, so we have a native stack and, uh, and a scripted stack. And we wanted to be able to profile both stacks at the same time. Um, and we couldn't really find a, a good profiler for, uh, for this kind of uh, use case. So we decided to build our own. And before we did that, we got the requirements, what we actually want to achieve by building the new profiler. And so those are the requirements. First of all, we only targeting user space profiling. Um, obviously, for those limited platforms, we couldn't even load anything to kernel, uh, so user space only. Uh, we needed to build it as a library because, as I said, we can't run another process, so it needs to be embedded to, uh, to the application itself. Um, since uh, those devices are sometimes very low-end devices, like, I don't know, a single-core uh, CPU, 600, 900 megahertz. Well, for, for some people, it's not really low-end, but uh, for us, it is. Um, so we try to uh, make the profiler so the overhead is 
not that significant. Um, for some devices, we also don't have access to persistent storage, so we can't save results uh, on the disk. Or sometimes we can, but we cannot access those uh, data after that because the, this persistent storage is only available from the application point of view. So you can't log into the device and gather the data. Um, so we decided, okay, let's assume that we don't have the persistent storage at all. Um, and since we're running on different platforms, uh, different uh, manufacturers, we wanted to have the profiler as portable as possible so we can build it once. Uh, our developers learn the tool once and they can use it for, uh, for all the possible platforms that we support. And it should be easy to use, uh, of course, so everybody can instrument the code easily and gather data uh, quite easily. So we come up with a very, very basic design. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's a user application layer. It's basically the application uh, that is running on the device. And this application links to the Hog Tracer library. Uh, Hog Tracer library might have a bunch of timelines. The timelines are basically uh, like a buffers uh, where user uh, sends events. So whenever you want to trace something, I don't know, for example, we want to we want to know how much memory we use at this point of time. It gener we generate an event uh, that contains the information about the memory usage. It goes to the timeline. And the timeline uh, accumulates those, buff uh, those events. And once the timeline is full, it calls the flush method. And the flush method sends all the events that we gather to, uh, to a listener. And the listener can be either, you can use either the uh, the one that is already existing in the library, or you can define your own listener. And what listener can do? Well, basically, listener should save the data somehow. Uh, so there is a file listener that saves it to the file, or there's a TCP listener that streams the data uh, over the network. And then the data is basically the binary stream, and you can't really, um, you can't really analyze the binary stream. You need to convert this binary stream to some human readable format. And in order to do that, we created um, a library. It's called Hog Tracer Parcel Library uh, that allow us to convert this byte stream uh, to uh, some structures that then can be uh, converted to another, uh, to another format. And so there are two options. You can either use Hog Tracer Converter, uh, which is an application that converts this byte stream to one of the well-known uh, formats, like we currently support uh, trace event format that is uh, supported by Google Trace Viewer, and we also generate flame graphs. Uh, if that's not enough for you, um, the tab parser library can be used. Uh, you can use that for writing your own client, your own converter, and it's available either for C++, uh, Python, or, or Rust. Uh, I'll show later how to do it in Python. It's quite easy. Um, so yeah, I mentioned uh, those three components already. Um, so the event is, is the thing that basically uh, carries the information that we want to uh, that we want to kind of have in the in the result. Like for example, I don't know time spent in the function or memory usage, CPU usage at the that point of time. Uh, it supports infer inheritance, so you can have an event and then you can inherit from that event uh, to add more fields. For example, um, the timeline is basically a buffer uh, where you push events. Uh, the timeline also timestamps the event. Uh, so every time you, uh, you push the event, event to the timeline, it, it gets timestamped so we, you know exactly when the event happened. Um, it, can be, it can be either uh, thread safe or not thread safe, lock free. Uh, that means that if you, were, if you know that the timeline is used only in the single thread, there's no point of introducing mutexes and stuff like that. Uh, but if you want to use the same timeline across different threads and push events, from different threads, then you need to enable the uh, thread safety feature. But obviously, that introduces uh, some extra overhead uh, because you need to lock the mutex every time you push uh, an event. And the timeline listener is basically a C function uh, that the user defines uh, that gets all, all the events and does something with them. And so I show you how to define uh, your your custom class. So let's say. Um, you want to create a, you want to trace uh, memory usage and the CPU usage. Um, so how you do that? You basically use the HTTP declare event class macro, and the first argument of that macro is is the name of uh, of your event. The second one uh, is the base event class because, as I said, it supports inheritance, and all the events must at least inherit from HTTP event is a base class. Um, 
and then you define fields, and uh, each field uh, is defined by three uh, properties. Uh, is a type, is either integer, string, uh, struct, float, double, uh, and pointer. And then the second argument is a C type, uh, so it's either int, uint 64t as here, or car, or, or other. And the last, uh, last one is, uh, is the name of, the, of that field. And that, uh, that macro generates basically loads of code. Uh, the most important was, one is that it actually generates the C structure. Uh, so you can see here uh, that it generated the resource usage event C structure with those fields and with the, with the base field of type HT event. And the HT event type has basically an ID. Each event has a unique identifier, so we can distinguish them. Uh, it has a timestamp, as I mentioned, that's a pointer to a class that describes uh, that data structure. And it also generates few helper functions. Uh, is the, one, the function is for, the first one is for serialize, serializing the event. So it serializes that event to, to the byte stream. Um, the other one is for uh, getting event class instance. So if you at runtime need to know what's the, uh, what's the structure of that event, you can use that function. And uh, the last one is the most important, I think, because it's, it's used for registering this event class in the, in the hog tracer system. So before you use uh, the event class, you need to call that function. Uh, otherwise, hog tracer doesn't know uh, what's the class and probably will crash if you forget about this. And um, basically, so the, 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 the byte stream uh, that is sent to a client, um, the client doesn't know about events, event classes that you defined in, uh, in your application, right? So you can define your applications and then have the client that receives the stream, but it doesn't know what, uh, what events uh, did you define. So first, before we send any events, we send the metadata stream, and it basically contains uh, information about all the, of all the event classes that you registered. So it contains uh, information about the class name, uh, about the class identifier, and all the fields uh, that are defined in the class. So then, and the next, uh, when we actually send the stream, uh, so it's below, first we send the class ID, uh, and then we send all the other fields. So then the parser knows, okay, I got this class ID, I know how to parse this because I already got the metadata stream, so I know that the next field is, for example, a timestamp field, and it has eight bytes, uh, the next field is a CPU usage, it also has eight bytes, in is integer, so I know how to parse it. Um, so there's no need to recompile a client if you add a new class uh, uh, to your library. Uh, timeline, uh, basically most of the time uh, we are using the global timeline. And the global timeline is not actually the single timeline, it's a timeline per thread. Uh, so we don't have to uh, lock everything uh, every time we, we push something to that timeline. Um, but it shares the listeners, so if you register a listener to one of the timelines in one of the threads, uh, you will uh, kind of automatically register it for all the other threads for global timeline. If you really need to create your own timeline, you can do that, uh, but as I said, it's very, very uncommon use case. So I just recommend you to use a global timeline, and to access the global timeline, just call ht global timeline get. It will return a pointer to that timeline. Um, so, our most common use case is to measure the time spent in a function or time spent in the scope. So we've also introduced uh, some of the helper macros uh, that allow you to measure the time we spend in a scope. Uh, so there's HTTP function that takes a timeline pointer as an argument and it basically measures uh, the time spent in the foo function uh, and the output, uh, if you look uh, at the end of the slide, is basically it generates a new event uh, with the duration, which is how much we spent in that, uh, in that scope. Uh, it also adds information about the thread uh, identifier, so you know that this function was called in, uh, in this particular thread. And it also adds the label, so in that case, uh, the HTTP function macro sets the function name as a label. Uh, if you want to trace custom scope, you can do that. It's just another macro and plus uh, you also need to add a custom label uh, for that. Uh, and this, th those macros are only available in C++ and in the GNU C compiler because um, 
C basically does not have such thing like a, like a destructor, so we don't kind of we don't have a way to call a callback at the end of the scope. Uh, if you want to measure arbitrary code, not necessarily uh, not necessarily a, a scope. There's also a set of functions start uh, call stack start string and the stop, and that measures the time between uh, calling those two functions. And again, it generates the same event uh, with the label that you specified here. Yeah, so the scope is basically like a scope of the C++, C++ variable. Uh, so in this example, uh, the, the scope of this trace point, HTTP function, is the whole function. Uh, but here, it only is instead of uh, inside this curly braces. So yeah, that's the scope. And uh, so that was more or less about the hog tracer internals. And now how can you integrate it with your project? If you just download the source code, do make, make install, uh, it will install the pkg config file. Um, so you can just use a pkg config and uh, compile it with your, uh, with your project. Uh, this hog tracer itself uh, uses a CMake uh, as a build system. Uh, so you can either use it as an external project very easily. Uh, there is a, an example how to actually do that. So I recommend you to copy just the hog tracer.cmake file to your repository and, uh, and include it in your project. Or uh, if you installed it uh, as, a, as a system library, uh, you can just use a find package hog tracer with a specific version and then uh, link it to your project. And the th third uh, option is I, I, the one that I actually recommend is that we basically, it's like SQLite, it has many files, but at the end, all those files get merged to a single file. So the same hog tracer. Uh, we have three files eventually. We have htconfig, where you can modify a configuration. We have a header file and the CPP file where the whole implementation is. And the CPP file, it can actually be compiled using a C compiler. You might just uh, not have all the features. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's possible to compile it just uh, using the C compiler. What is the license? MIT. Sorry, I should mention that before. Yeah, the license is MIT, so you should be able to use it as you want. Okay, um, so demo. Uh, the first demo. Um, so I've implemented um, a sorting algorithm. Uh, it sorts 400 numbers, and it turns out that the algorithm is very slow. So if you see, I press enter now. And yeah, it took a while to, to sort uh, those numbers. There was only 400 numbers, so it should be like very quickly. Um, so let's look at the source code. Um, we call the quick sort here. So now we want to know why is it slow. And in order to know why is it slow, we need to uh, instrument our code. Uh, so I'll show you how to set up uh, the code to, to, to basically work with hog tracer. At the beginning, uh, you need to call ht init function. Uh, this is very important. It initializes some internal buffers uh, and registers some base classes. Uh, so don't forget about this. Uh, then we need to create the listener. As I said, uh, the timeline needs to have a listener. Otherwise, no one will be able to access those events that we generate. So for this purpose, we, we decided to use a file listener. A file listener basically saves all the events uh, to a file. So we decided to... Save, uh, save it to a sort.htdump file, as a, so it will generate the binary file. Um, there is some check if the listener was created correctly. Uh, then we register the listener uh, to the timeline because we cr only created an instance here, but now we need to actually register it to the timeline. And uh, we use the global timeline as this is the most convenient uh, thing to do. Uh, this is the callback of the function, and this is uh, like a user data, so the callback knows the context. And then we initialize our input. So we generate 400 uh, random numbers. And then we quick sort uh, this array. So if you see, if you look at the functions, we basically, I added to all the functions, I've added this trace point. So whenever function gets called, we generate the event. How long did it take to, uh, to execute that particular function? And we have a few other functions. We have a partition function, we have a quick sort function, and we also have a swap function. So now, uh, I run this. 
it was already instrumented. So if you look here, it already generated this uh, sort.ht dump file. And now, uh, this is a binary file. So if you try to open the, yeah, you will see this is basically the binary file. Uh, so what we can do, uh, we can convert that binary stream to something that we can actually read. And I mentioned about the Hawk Tracer converter uh, program. So if you look at this, you see that uh, this uh, program takes basically three mandatory parameters. The first is format, which is an output format, uh, which we convert our data to. And it can be either a flame graph or a Chrome trace, uh, or it can be a debug, which basically prints everything as it is. Uh, so we decide to use um, Chrome Trace. Another parameter is uh, output file. Let's say sort slow JSON and, uh, and the source. Source is very important as the program needs to know where to get the data from. Uh, and the source, this uh, Chrome Tracing uh, how, how Tracer Converter uh, tool only supports two sources. It's either uh, a file name or a TCP IP address. Uh, in case we, for example, stream the data over the network, it can listen to, uh, to a specific port and uh, receive the data. So the source is uh, sort HTDump. So we run it. It's processing the data. It's completed successfully. Uh, let's see if we have this. Yes. So we have sort slow. And now uh, we can use the Chrome Tracing Viewer to actually see why our application is slow. So I load the JSON file that we generated, and we see basically this shows the call stacks uh, of, uh, in, of our application. The x, uh, x axis is the time. And, uh, and we see that basically since the quicksort is a recursive algorithm, we, we see that quicksort calls quicksort and so on and so on. But if we look closer, we basically see that apart from calling quicksort, it, it also calls something different. And if we zoom in more, we see that actually most of the time we spend in the swap function. I don't know if you can see, but this is basically it's, uh, it's quicksort. The blue one is a quicksort function. Then the green one is partition. And the, green, the light green is, is a swap method. So we spent quite a lot of time in the swap method. So that's probably a function that we should look into. And uh, if we see how the swap method is implemented, it takes A and B as arguments, and we want to swap values. Um, so how did we do that? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> it's someone implemented it as the saving uh, is to a temporary file. And then it's actually serialized to a string. And then we read it. Uh, that's probably why it's slow. So if we just change the implementation to something like uh, this, um, can you do it without temporary variable? Um, yeah, there is a trick with XOR. Yeah, uh, I, I'd, I'd have to think about it, but yeah, I definitely that's possible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if we fix that, then probably our trace is going to look completely differently, uh, believe me. R saving temporary data to a file and read it after that is, is a waste of time. Uh, so I'm not going to recompile it and rerun it. I, I guess you all believe me that this is going to fix our performance problem and it's going to be much, much faster. We need to say they might not be the best. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, live demo never works. <laughs> so that was the first demo. And the second demo, um, so as I mentioned, so for, imagine that uh, we previously we, I, I showed you how to, how to create your own uh, class, uh, which was uh, for memory usage and CPU usage tracking. And actually using the Chrome Tracing Viewer, we couldn't visualize this, so how can we how can we see like a custom data? Uh, so for that, I, as I mentioned, uh, we can build our own uh, our own client to to process events. So uh, there is a module Hawk Tracer for Python. It's very simple to use. 
you create a client, uh, you start the connection. So I said, okay, 127001 on port 8765. And then whenever we receive an event here, we check if the event name is resource usage event. If it is, then we take the CPU usage, we take a memory usage, we print CPU usage, and we draw memory usage on the graph. Uh, I'm not a Python developer, so maybe that's not the best uh, way to, to graph something, but it works. And the, our code is very, very similar to the previous one. Uh, instead of doing the file listener, we created the TCP listener that basically creates a server that streams the data. Uh, we also had this uh, the class that I showed before. So this is the definition of our class. And then every, every second here in the while loop, uh, we allocate some amount of memory, half of a kilobyte. Then we make our CPU busy and we sleep for, uh, for one second and we report uh, resource usage. So let's see how do we report the resource usage. Uh, there's a macro HT timeline push event. It takes the timeline as a first argument, then the event type, uh, then values of that event that we want to attach uh, to this event, and then we, and then we push, uh, the, and that pushes it. We also flush the timeline manually instead of waiting uh, for the buffer to get full because we want to have the data immediately in the client so it's kind of smooth drawing. Uh, so we can run the demo. I run the resource usage and I run my Python client. And yeah, you can see that it draws the memory usage here. So basically what we've done, we, we made our custom kind of event converter and we decided how we visualize the data in Python just in, I don't know, 20 lines of code. And also the CPU usage is printed here. So it's around, yeah, one, two, three percent. Um, yeah, so that was the second demo. Uh, there's a bunch of things that we want to do uh, for the future. There are some missing uh, features, like we don't support floating point numbers at the moment. Uh, optional fields is also something we want to have. So for example, you have a, a class with some events, uh, with some fields, but sometimes some of the fields should not be included. So that would be nice to have. We also want to have more converters in the whole tracer converter, like a CTF is a common trace format supported by Trace Compass or LTTNG Scope Viewer. Uh, so it would be nice to have. Uh, we use that profiler also for profiling C++ and Lua or JavaScript stack at the same time, but the Lua bindings and JavaScript bindings are not open sourced. Uh, so we also want to do that. Um, and lots of documentation improvements, even though the documentation is quite okay, uh, I see we can, we can improve that more. Uh, so yeah, if you want to help, uh, just go to hogtracer.org slash community um, and you will find how to, uh, how to contact us and uh, we, we can work together. Yeah, there's a bunch of links. Um, there's also a Rust uh, bindings. Uh, Alex had a talk today uh, afternoon. Uh, so if you search for FOSDEM 2019 profiling Rust, uh, you should find that presentation. It was pretty cool. Uh, okay, thank you. I think we have a few minutes, yeah. Yes? Approximately, yeah, how much work is it to create a set of bindings for another language? Um, so th that depends. S creating new event or having ability to create a new event class in the other language might be quite cr tricky. But assuming that you already have all the event classes defined in your C, uh, or C++ code base and you run it, uh, your other language on top of that, it should be fairly easy because you just need to expose. So for measuring time, you need to expose two functions, start and stop, plus maybe start hook tracer or star register listener. So it should be fairly easy. For Rust, uh, I don't know how much work that was for Alex. One two days yeah. for making it visible, I think. Yeah. Like, and the interface in... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't support custom events yet. So yeah. those are a bit trickier. In the event, you might get away with macros, but I didn't get around to this. Yeah. That depends what you want to do. But if you just want to measure time, it should be, should be fairly easy. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.